Hello everyone, and welcome to Dr. Mercola's Cellular Wisdom. I'm Ethan Foster, your unassuming observer of the human condition. Some say I'm like a microscope, quiet, focused, and scarily precise. And I'm Alara Sky, the self-appointed comedic voice in this conversation. My wit might cut like a scalpel, but I promise to clean up after myself. Ethan, I see you're ready to tackle yet another fascinating topic that's deep in our guts. Absolutely. Today we're diving into our own internal jungles, otherwise known as the gut microbiome. Specifically, we'll talk about how bacteria in our digestive tracts might be staging a hostile takeover if we're not careful. And apparently, they're especially interested in the colon. Yes, the colon. The VIP lounge no one wants to talk about. But everyone needs to keep in good standing. You know, the older I get, the more I realize that colon health is basically adulting at its finest. There's no escaping it. What's happening with colon cancer these days that has experts sounding the alarm? Early onset colorectal cancer is on the rise. It used to be something mostly associated with older adults. But now, folks under 45 are starting to see a spike. Some data suggest a nearly 50% increase in early onset cases over a few decades. That's unsettling, to say the least. I always hoped we'd see a spike in something more cheerful, like random acts of kindness or comedic poetry slams. But instead, we get colon cancer creeping in on younger folks. Do we have a culprit? Part of the blame goes to changes in our gut microbiome. Certain bacterial strains, like specific types of E. coli and Fusobacterium, seem determined to misbehave. They produce chemicals that damage DNA setting off a domino effect leading to mutations. And if you're exposed to these troublemaker bacteria early in life, you might see a diagnosis earlier too. So these gut bacteria basically have their own gangster mob. They roam around with toxic substances, roughing up our intestinal cells and leaving these poor cells battered and bruised. Then one day, the battered cells say, why not become a tumor? Precisely, we've got a gut underworld scenario. And here we thought a rowdy stomach just meant we ate too many spicy nachos. In reality, some of these microscopic hooligans are quite dangerous. Researchers have even identified a mutational signature linked to a strain of E. coli that produces a nasty toxin called colobactin. Colobactin. Sounds like an unwanted Marvel supervillain. Beware of colobactin. It's mutating your cells when you least expect it. On a serious note, scientists are studying these mutations across different populations globally, which shows how widespread this issue may be. Dr. David Kerr from Oxford talked about how our diets have changed over the last quarter century. More processed foods, more sugar, more everything. And as we feed ourselves with these questionable choices, we inadvertently feed these bad bugs too. That's the big shift. Our microbiomes are a lot more welcoming to these criminals. It's like we turned our gut into a luxury resort for E. coli and Fusobacterium, complete with an all-you-can-eat buffet of processed treats. We've certainly rolled out the red carpet, but let's not forget the good guys in our gut. We have beneficial bacteria that help produce a champion molecule called beauty rate. Ah, beauty rate. I've heard it's like a personal trainer for your colon cells keeping them fit and healthy. That's a nice analogy. Research shows that butyrate can stop cancer cells from growing uncontrollably. It basically recalibrates them to behave more like normal cells. Butyrate also affects processes like energy use inside these cells, which is a big deal. When you have enough butyrate, you might be better protected against colon cancer. So if butyrate is our ally, that means we want a diet that supports butyrate production, which begs the question, how exactly do we feed this good guy? Fiber, dear Ethan. But like all good things, there's a catch. You don't want to just bombard your gut with fiber if it's already in a state of chaos. For those with dysbiosis, an imbalance in the gut, it's better to heal first before ramping up the fiber. But if your gut is relatively healthy, fiber fuels the good bacteria so they can produce more butyrate. Makes sense. And fiber, ironically, is in the foods many of us run away from. Vegetables, fruits, legumes, and even cooked and cooled potatoes or rice that form something called resistant starch. Yes, those retro-cool potatoes. Cook them, chill them, and suddenly your gut bacteria throw a party. That's the gist. But let's pivot and talk about the microbes themselves, because certain ones are singled out for their troublemaking ways. There's Streptococcus bovius, Fusobacterium nucleatum, and the infamous E. coli gangs. They produce toxins and cause inflammation. Once chronic inflammation sets in, normal checks and balances within cells get compromised. Exactly. And don't forget about the delightful process known as oxidative stress. Some of these bacteria generate reactive oxygen species, essentially tiny bombs that damage our cellular structures, including DNA. Over time, that damage can push cells to become cancerous. So it's not just one mechanism. It's a pileup, chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, direct DNA damage. All of this can lead to earlier tumors, especially if you're unlucky enough to encounter these bacteria as a child or teenager. And diagnosing early onset colorectal cancer can be tricky because it's often mistaken for milder conditions like irritable bowel syndrome. Plus, Many younger adults don't think they're at risk, so they might dismiss certain symptoms. Nobody wants to think serious illness could strike in your 20s or 30s, but apparently colon cancer doesn't care about our illusions of youthful invincibility. It's quite disconcerting. 
Another angle to consider is how we manage treatment. Traditional approaches, surgery, chemo, radiation, can be harsh, have serious side effects, and might not address the root cause, which includes dysbiosis. You can take out a tumor, but if your gut environment stays rotten, what's to stop another tumor from setting up shop? Exactly, and that's why the spotlight on gut health is so crucial. If we can keep certain bacteria in check, or even cultivate beneficial species, it could be a game changer for prevention and possibly for treatment outcomes too. Take Fusobacterium nucleatum, for instance. It's implicated in dampening our immune response, making chemotherapy less effective. So if we could reduce its levels or neutralize its harmful effects, we might see better responses to treatments. So in a perfect world, we'd have a thorough screening of our gut's micro-community, identify any shady characters, and manage them before they cause havoc. But we're not quite there yet, are we? We're inching closer. More studies are focusing on how to pinpoint these bad actors early. There's also talk about therapeutic interventions, like using targeted probiotics or phage therapy that attack specific bacteria. And let's not skip mention of a simpler step, dietary cleanup. People talk about eliminating processed foods and especially seed oils loaded with linoleic acid. Dr. Mercola himself calls LA a mitochondrial poison. That's a grim endorsement if I've ever heard one. Think about how much LA is in typical fast food or even those fancy restaurant meals. Most places cook with seed oils like soybean or canola. All that LA accumulates and disrupts your cells' energy-making capabilities. If your mitochondria aren't producing energy efficiently, it affects everything, including your gut environment. Then there's also the matter of total carbohydrate intake. Dr. Mercola's viewpoint suggests not demonizing carbs entirely, but rather optimizing them. That means focusing on whole food carbs like fruits, white rice, and gradually adding fiber if your gut can tolerate it. Yes, it's a balancing act. If someone's gut is severely out of whack, they may need to go slowly. Maybe even starting with something like dextrose water if they're very sensitive. But for most of us, it just means being deliberate and not overdoing it on refined junk. So the big picture is this. Cultivate good gut bacteria, feed them properly, keep the hooligans in check, avoid foods that feed the chaos, and limit exposure to toxins that hamper our mitochondria. That's a recipe that helps lower your risk of colorectal cancer. It's all connected. Environment, diet, microbes, and our own cellular machinery. One chain breaks, and it drags the rest down with it. That's why synergy is so important. Our bodies are basically an ecosystem. And we haven't even touched on how endocrine-disrupting chemicals or EMFs could come into play. Dr. Mercola suggests these factors also mess with cellular energy. Another reason to be mindful of what we're exposed to daily. Antibiotic misuse can exterminate beneficial bacteria opening up prime real estate for the troublemakers. So if you must take antibiotics, do it judiciously and support your gut flora afterward. Let's also talk about Ackermansia. Isn't that one beneficial bacterium that's somewhat of a rock star these days? It is. Many folks have little or none of it. But you can't just pop an Ackermansia supplement and call it a day, especially if your gut environment is toxic. Eliminating seed oils for at least six months might help create a friendlier neighborhood for Ackermansia to thrive. Then you consider fancy packaging for the supplement. So the bacteria survive long enough to reach your colon. Because if you pour them in like confetti and they all die halfway down your digestive tract, that's not particularly helpful. Precisely. It's like throwing a welcome party on top of a volcano. You want a stable environment or else all your good intentions go up in smoke. Which brings us back to a fundamental point. Diet is huge. If you take away the unhealthy seed oils, processed foods, and you ensure your beneficial microbes have enough fiber, you're building a fortress against colon cancer. And if you're starting to sweat about never eating chicken or pork again, remember that small amounts of certain foods might be okay if your LA intake is still kept low. The trick is to track it. Use an online nutrition tracker, see where you stand, and aim for fewer than five grams of LA daily if possible. It's a process, not an instant transformation, but it pays off in better energy, better gut health, and hopefully a lower risk of visiting the dreaded realm of early onset colorectal cancer. And for those who are worried they might already have a compromised gut, the message is that healing is possible. Start small, remove toxins, maybe use targeted supplements to restore that healthy ecosystem. Then, once your gut is stable, reintroduce fibrous foods slowly and watch your beneficial bacteria flourish. With all this talk about gut microbes, I feel like we should put them on a payroll. They work so hard when they're not rebelling, of course, but if we treat them right, they'll treat us right. That's the beauty of synergy. Respect the microbes, fuel them with quality nutrition, keep your mitochondria humming and everything lines up. Your cells and colon will thank you. And that, my friends, wraps up another deep dive into Dr. Mercola's cellular wisdom. We've journeyed through rebellious bacteria, heroic butyrate, the perils of seed oils, and a cautionary tale about ignoring your gut's well-being. All roads lead to a balanced microbiome, which could be the frontline defense against rising early-onset colon cancer. Ethan, I'll let you keep your microscope persona. It suits you. And to our listeners, remember, your gut might be silent most of the time, 
but it's carrying on one rowdy conversation. Make sure it's a constructive one. Until next time, I'm Alara Sky. And I'm Ethan Foster, signing off. Take good care of those microbes, folks. They're mightier than you think. Thanks for watching. Subscribe now and click the notification bell so you never miss an update. See you in the next video.